So throughout the day, we've been hearing of all sorts of challenges that we face when considering the future of food. And the challenges are going to require creativity. And we thought that there's no better assemblage of people to talk about creativity than a group of six visiting Nobel laureates. So I'd like to start by asking them about what they think is the best condition for fostering creativity. Let's start at the end of the row. Steve. Well, I think it's um, the immediate environment that we find ourselves in. Um, immediate environment means colleagues. Uh, but there's also another thing, and that is um, there's also it's about food, but I'm going to talk about another <laughs> hunger uh, that um, uh, people are driven because they really want to understand how the world works. There is another thing, and they really uh, want to do some good in the world. And especially in my career, as I got older, I began to uh, that began to dictate what I was getting interested in. And as after coming out of government, I starting a new lab again, and that has also influenced uh, which direction I'm going. Mm. And do you feel conditions for creativity these days are improving, generally? Uh, uh, you, it's mixed. Uh, I think what you need is you have to have an environment that nurtures young people that says, if you do want to, I'll stick to science, say, go into science and do good things, that it there's a possibility that you can get a job, not to get rich, but to, <laughs> but to be able to, to do the things you want to do, whether it's in academia or in industry or someplace like that. And I think there's, it's a mixed bag. I think like a lot of the younger people don't feel quite as encouraged as I did when I was growing up in the United States. But I grew up in a Sputnik era where you know, they wanted to really uh, train a new generation of scientists. Yeah, but why shouldn't there be challenges like that now? It's there should be. Oh, I mean, if you consider that it, this is what we have to do and what we're facing in terms of climate change, in terms of energy, sustainability, food, the whole thing, this is a calling that's huge and a huge scientific challenge. And, and uh, rather than going to arms or being um, financed by a Cold War, this is something that uh, should get societal interest. It should get people to say, yes, this is something that society at writ large can rise up to, and it is a huge challenge. Liz, I'm, coming, I'm going randomly among you. What do you think? I loved what Patti Smith said when she evoked silence, because to me, that's where that's where the wellspring of creativity really, really comes. And, and I think it's when you, you look at the wonder of nature. Uh, I, I'm president of the Salk Institute, and one of the young scientists said to me, when I walk across the courtyard of the Salk Institute and I look at the stars, I think anything is possible. And she, no, and she just said this to me, and I just thought, Oh, I'm, that's what I love, is being in a place where people have that sort of inspiration from what they do. But I think that's, we, we have to let silence sort of happen so we can let that creativity rise up. I'm reminded of these jellyfish images, which is sort of like the thoughts, you know, creativity <laughs> coming up. So I think we have to make space for silence, and I think that's where creativity will grow. I guess it's harder and harder to find space for silence. These Noise-cancelling headphones. Let's use technology. <laughs> <laughs> Christiana, what do you think? Yeah, I, this is this is much to my thoughts too. I mean, silence is perhaps not the exact right word. I think um, you have one has to shield oneself from all these influences. And when you ask the question, what what have what, what changed in the past 20, 30 years? We are so overwhelmed with information. And we can get information so quickly. And when I think we easily fall into this trap to just look into the internet constantly and get distracted from our own thoughts. And I think if you want to be creative, you must concentrate, focus on something. You must shield yourself from, from out, outside influences and, and poke on, on these questions, why and how 
uh, when you when they raise your interest and and um, yeah and I think this is really something we 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 have to keep in mind that if you want to be creative, not just productive, uh, and we want to be original, not just productive, <laughs> we have to concentrate and 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 be a little isolated from from interchanging constantly with other with other people and other influences. It's, it's somewhat contra to the kind of current thinking that people so frequently say that the information, information age makes everything possible. <laughs> this networking idea that you'd constantly have to be in contact with other people is just not... I, I don't think it's the best way. I mean, you need to be connected, of course, but you also have to find your own way and not be constantly asking what are the others doing and what's coming up there and what's coming up there. I think that's really important. Rich? <laughs> yes, in my case, I tend to be rather skeptical. And so if people tell me, oh, you shouldn't do this, I always think maybe there's something really good to do there. And if they say, oh, do this, I think that's going to be mundane, and so I kind of like to do other things. Um, I have an inherent curiosity about many things, nature included, and I, I would agree totally, you need to be inside yourself from time to time so that you can really look and see, is there something interesting going on that you would like to know how it works? Uh, my own work at the moment is on bacteria. Uh, and there is something very interesting going on in bacteria, and, and we understand a little bit of it, but there's a, a big swath of it that we really don't understand at the moment. And so for me, that's what gets me up in the morning, it's what stops me from sleeping at night, and it's what drives my wife crazy because I'm always trying to find out about this okay. stuff. <laughs> I sleep up. Angus, may I? Well, I think I agree with everything that's been said, but um, not enough to give up my chance to speak. Um, I, it's, I, and I, I want to say something too. I mean, you've got six attested, or how many of us are? Six, yeah. Six attested creators here. So if you want to know more about creativity, maybe you should ask the people who were not creative and why they were not. They wouldn't know <laughs> because they're not creative. <laughs> because if you want more creativity, then you know, you've got to get to those people. Um, it's clearly true that you need to sink into yourself. So that part of it, I think, we'd probably all attest to. You need lonely time somewhere deep in some place where you're struggling to get out of. But one thing that I'm not sure is widely appreciated is just how important the social incentives are for creating creativity. So I think throughout history, um, there's a sort of micro view of someone sitting there waiting for <laughs> creativity to fall on their heads. But if you study it in a more macro historical perspective, there's usually something going on in the environment which is pressurizing people to solve that problem. This is not mechanical at all in the sense that there are many pressles, pressing social problems that don't get solved that way. But if you think of cholera, for instance, the 19th century cholera wave was um, very important in producing the germ theory of disease. And you could make a good argument that if there had not been the cholera epidemics, the germ theory would have been much postponed or much learned. There's a very respectable set of theories that says the Industrial Revolution in Britain was caused by high wages in Britain, and Britain had sort of won the age of empire, and so British working people were so expensive that people looked for substitutes, and it was the looking for substitutes that spurred the creativity that generated the Industrial Revolution. So I can tell stories, of course, the war on cancer has not been nearly so successful in producing great innovations that or great creativity yet. around cancer. Yet. yet. No, <laughs> I, I, I believe that it will. It will. It but nevertheless, you can, <laughs> these things are, can't be tailored to order. It's not a process like that. But it, it's really a mistake to think about a lonely individual, you know, just something falling hmm. on their head, and you get this revelation. And it also suggests that lots more people who were not creative could have been creative had they been in the environment, 
you know, I was lucky enough to be around where there was a bunch of stuff going on that I could retreat with me to my dark hole and work on and come up with something new. But if those things had not been there, it wouldn't have been possible for me to do mm. that. Steve talks about being a Sputnik scientist. I mean, that's another very good example of how social pressure said, we, you know, we've got to do something about this. So they poured money into education and produced the physicists that they needed. You know, it, sometimes it works. So, and yeah. that, that, that mention of the creative <coughs> power of the individual plays exactly into Muhammad Yunus's yeah. points he's been making. So. Well, I, I look at it as a, a process, like um, all impossibles will ultimately become possible. Uh, now we have a bigger chance because uh, impossibles get possible faster than it did before. So I tell the young people particularly, uh, now figure it out, make a list of all the impossibles that you see. Hmm. Because soon that list will be shorter and shorter. You'll miss out your chance to translate one of those impossibles into possible. So before you exhaust your chance, you better get in and do it. <laughs> this is one way to activate, activate the process that you have endless power, creative power yourself. But if you, first of all, you become aware of that power, and then when you become aware of the creative power that you have, then uh, you ask yourself, what are you going to use it for? Having power is meaningless if you're not using it. So this is another attraction that how to make the use of that creative power. And I take the example of uh, science fiction. I said I love, I love science fiction because it's all about wild imagination. All kinds of things possible in science fiction. That's why we get glued into science fiction. We want to watch it, what's happening. And we know f absolutely very well these are all fairy tales. It, uh, it doesn't exist, probably it will never exist. But we like that, that the power of imagination is, comes up there. And I say, and the science, uh, sorry, technology follows the science fiction and make it happen. And many of the things we see today uh, in everybody's uh, position are things which were in science fiction at one time and now became real. Huh? I said, I wish somebody had a series like science fiction, a social fiction. Make wild ideas about the society, how this can be. The wilder it gets, more challenging and more creative it becomes because that's where now fascination comes and maybe we should get together and make it happen. I like your use of the phrase fairy tales because people would presumably mostly dismiss it as childish, but maybe that's where, every, where we should be thinking. It's about what we should be aspiring for. How important is creativity? How much of a role did it play in your own? I would say it's a core of human being. Okay. Without creativity, human being, just like another species, which has not much to contribute. A human being takes challenges, has imagination, and that imagination triggers all the uh, creative power inside of them to make it happen. Uh, human being, I don't think they accept impossibles. They get always get uh, kind of uh, challenged by seeing something impossible. Always say, why can't we do it possible? Which ways do we do that? So we keep on pushing that door, keep pushing that frontier, making it happen. That's why things start happening. Liz, you're nodding. Do you want to say? Oh, I was responding to the... Uh, yes, when I think you were saying, does that play a role in what... what yeah. You know, we, we saw something happening with DNA that shouldn't have been happening. You know, the textbook said it shouldn't be happening. So I had to imagine there was something, and I imagined an enzyme, right? And, you know, it said, well, this thing that doesn't exist, maybe it exists. And so I think that was a creativity aspect of it, to imagine <laughs> something that wasn't there before. Then you had, there was hard work of going in and actually finding it. But um, I think you had to first imagine the possibility of something that nobody had ever said should be going on. Okay. So that's <laughs> very important. Thank you. Christiana. Yanni. I think creativity in, in a sense is combining facts which no one else had combined before. So finding connections between things which are everybody can see. but. To, to get the connections in your brain means that you have, you let the, these different things enter your brain and then play around. And we all know this, that you think about th something very hard and you can't find a solution. And next morning you wake up and all of a sudden you know the solution. And this is, and the mind somehow uses it the, inf the information input and, and, and somehow it there is working in the brain in your unconsciousness. And I think, what is very important as a basic 
basis for that is to have the right surrounding which gives you this input, which you can use. So I think when, when young people ask me where they should go, what they should study or so, I always say go to a good place where there are smart people who pop up ideas and information which is interesting and not just to places where, yeah, the Abby, I mean, where it's just not interesting. And no. interesting means something special and you get m several interesting aspects and then you combine them in your head and then you create something new. I think that's, that's the essence. Thank you. We're getting very close to time. Uh, we're getting also very close to the end of the year and in some ways it's been a pretty tough year. So shall we end with some something <coughs> Positive, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> Give us a positive thought. Uh, I think <laughs> up, <laughs> big up call. Uh -oh. We hope to make it for the next four years. No. <laughs> 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 um, seriously, I, I think um, since we're here celebrating, uh, you know, the Nobel Prize, <coughs> no, science, um, it is something where I feel very deeply that uh, it's not only fun to do, but it can really help um, in many respects. Sometimes it helps decades later in a very unanticipated ways. And so that just doing what really interests you and knowing historically that the payback might not be immediate, may not be ever, but, but it, it, it's that long view that it will come back and, and, and uh, enrich the world. Mm. And it's that redefinition of the way payback, of the word payback. Yes, not maybe not in my lifetime, but uh, yes. Exactly. Okay, thank you all very much indeed. Thank you. I just have two things to say very quickly. The first is that none of this would be possible without all the participants and the audience and all the team who put it all together, but also the partners who pay for all this. And I would like just to name them, Academiska Hus, Kalbanete B, the city of Gothenburg, Ica, Ericsson, and this is always the difficult one for me. I kind of have to slow down because the pronunciation, the region Vestra Jutland. <laughs> and the other thing is just to say thank you and see you all in Gothenburg on the 9th of December in 2017 for the next Nobel Week Dialogue.